me supernal. Yeah, I think that oftentimes when there are people that actually have very, very authentic, genuine, mystical experiences and they sometimes wind up in psychiatric uh, wards. Uh, I've been to some psychiatric wards and so forth and it's just been some interesting encounters where where people will start describing when somebody says, how did you get here? They'll start describing what seems to be kind of a, a, a very euphoric or glorious experience and then it gets worse <laughs> after that when the, the guys in the white straitjackets, you know, come. Um, I think it was uh, Stanislav Grab that was talking, I remember many, many years ago, he was, he was calling it spiritual emergence and he actually established the Spiritual Emergence Network for those that were having these kind of mystical experiences and they felt very, very ungrounded. Like their worlds were just tossed around. Oftentimes, even when people have experiences with drugs, they'll have kind of, they'll be lifted up into kind of expanded states of consciousness and awareness. And it's quite glorious, except they usually have to come back down um, to what we would call the common everyday perception of, of consciousness and awareness. And that's a tough re-entry. So it's kind of a shattering re-entry. Um, I remember listening to one man from Australia who, who uh, was reading uh, Ram Dass's book, Be Here Now. And he got to a certain point of the book, a certain page, and he just, bing, he just gave his mind permission to let go. And he just felt like he was just lifted up into this, such a free, euphoric state of mind. And he said that what occurred after that was he basically was in La La Land, he called it, for about two weeks. And the people around him, really did perceive that he was very dysfunctional. His parents and, and other people that he knew. And then he describes a very hard re-entry, where it was like the ego was like taunting him like a gremlin and wagging its tongue at him and it was quite a graphic description. But that just kind of demonstrates that there's a big seeming gulf or gap between everyday human experience and this very heightened state of mind of being delocated. And for me, I have to say that um, I just had a, a, quite a few mystical experiences over the years and um, there, was, there was almost always a sense of, of disorientation associated with coming back from them uh, to what I consider my everyday perception. But then as I continue with the mind training of the Course, it just got more and more consistently expansive and there wasn't that coming down or re-entry. It was just more like, almost like a helium balloon, just kind of going up and up and up and up. And, and periodically I would have different experiences that, where I was shifting and shifting and I was losing kind of the standard or the, the association with the old and opening to what was really feeling brand new, and I would, I would have experiences like um, one time I was sailing, you know, on a boat, a ferry, over, uh, I think I was heading over to Salt Spring Island, I, I think it was up in the Pacific Northwest, and I was in the front end of this ferry, and they had one of these giant fog horns. I was up on the front deck at the very point of the ship, like, uh, like Kate and Leonardo in Titanic, you know, right in the very front. And I was with a friend of mine, Beverly, and then it was kind of foggy, and we were standing up there at the front of the ship, and then, without warning, the fog horn went off full blast. It was probably maybe 25 feet behind us, because we were right up in the top deck. And I just noticed her body, she, she seemed to jump maybe about six to eight inches um, off the ground and I just, and I didn't, uh, I just observed, like I could see this body go up and 
what seemed to be like a very sharp noise. I mean, sharp noises can't really scare you. It's the interpretation. It's always the interpretation in the mind that scares. It's where the fear is. It's nothing that happens in form with the five senses. So I just noticed her body go up and I looked over and saw it come down and then I was like, huh, oh, look at that. I mean it was again more of an observation like like that sharp loud noise. I wasn't influenced. I didn't flinch. I didn't even move. There was no reaction to it because I was just in the flow of presence and it was no different than anything else. And then probably a few years after that I I was working, continued my work with the Course, and a woman who I'd never met invited me to come to Cedar Point, uh, Sandusky, Ohio, and go up there, and she said, oh come, and my, my children come and go on the roller coaster rides with me, and do all the different things, and I said, oh, that sounds like a lot of fun. <laughs> so I did, I drove up there, and met her, and had a great holy encounter, and went on all these rides, well, some of the rides I would never, when I was a kid, I would never have gone on even. I would just not gone. I mean, the body that day was flipped around, upside down, you know, some of the new modern roller coasters and twirled around and this and this and this. And all I was in the roller coaster just going, hmm, this is really fun. I wasn't queasy, I wasn't dizzy, I wasn't disoriented. I was like, hmm, mind training must be taking hold here. Because I, I am not reacting and responding to this, to these roller coaster rides, like I did. I mean, this is not at all like my experience of roller coasters. So it was like, ah, oh, it was a stabilization occurring in mind through the mind training, and that was a progressive loosening from, from what I was perceiving. You know, like lesson number two from the course. I had given everything I see all the meaning it has for me. That's simply removing the meaning that I was projecting onto the world and not getting busy. Then, a couple of years later after that, I went to one of these IMAX theaters, but it was one of these cinemas where you, you walk in and they don't have seats. It was not quite an IMAX, it was called another thing. They had bars. You know, you stand there and there's bars. And you're supposed to like hold on to these bars because they're going to show you a film of like being on the back end of a, f of a, f like a ladder on a fire truck that's swerving around as you're going over the streets of San Francisco and over cliffs and it's all this cinematography and filming, you know, designed to make you very, very disoriented and dizzy. And that's why they have the bars there, so you can grab hold as you're perceiving all this. Really, nothing's shaking, nothing's moving. There's nothing at all, there's no forces hitting you, it's just all totally interpretation of the mind. And I was in there for like 15 minutes, and then when they finally stopped it, I just was standing there, not holding onto the bar, just watching the movie, and there was people falling down, groping on me, grabbing me in all places, and, and everybody else was like, yeah, it was just wild, you know, there was, because, it was like, that was like the untrained mind, that was kind of an example of interpretation, mm -hmm. of, of following those interpretations of the mind. You really weren't going around any corners, but yet everyone's like holding on to the pole, you know, to the bars and leaning and trying to stay up and leaning back and leaning against the bar and trying to hold on to the bar for stability. If you had filmed that, <laughs> it would look really crazy. It would look like a Three Stooges movie or something. Because it's like, what are these people doing? That is, they are sick. They are mentally sick. But what was, was it was the perceptions, the interpretations. So, progressively, as you keep doing the mind training, it's, it's not those delocating experiences become less and less disorienting and become more and more natural, progressively. And, and I know that my work with the Course started the, back in 1986. So it was a lot of years of mind training. It's time to calculate. That's like a quarter of a century ago. And it's really the focus and the dedication and the devotion. And 
and even though it can be quite disorienting at times, that's in the in the roadmap. He talks about it in there, like, don't be shocked if it feels this way, because here's what's coming. But that's what I like about a roadmap. That's what you want from a roadmap. You know, tell me where there's some bumps in the road. Tell me where there's some dips and some holes. You know, give me some clues, because this seems like a very unnatural process, but it, it's actually a natural process. So I just have to, you know, give myself over to it. And it's great when you have a roadmap from a good way shower. Somebody who's not speculating. That's what I love about the Course. There's no speculation in it. You know, he's not maybe, perhaps, you might, you know, it's like, <laughs> yeah, all the way through, you know. This is not a, a, a mind that's undecided, it's, it's a mind that has been through the temptations of time and space and come through, and now is reaching back to kind of say, here, take my hand, grab a hold of my pinky, anything. If it was like a rope, grab a hold of the rope, anywhere, bottom, middle, just get a good grip. And, and rise with me, you know, that's really what it's, what it's saying. <laughs>